We're going to be in the book of Acts, chapter 4, to start with. Now, if you want to just use the old-fashioned Bible, that's great too. And I see some, man, that's kind of cool. It's kind of like going back to the abacus or the slide rule these days. (laughs) Any of you ever use a slide rule? Okay, I just missed that, you know. I did. Like two, two years before, they were still using slide rules in chemistry, and then they came out with that Texas instrument uh, calculator about the size of, you know, a laptop, I don't remember, and it cost like an outrageous amount for that time. It'd be like $1,000 today in our, in, in our, our, you know, for back then. I don't, do you, anybody remember those first calculators? Yeah, woo! You have no idea. Yeah, okay. So Acts chapter 4, verse 23 to 31. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, now the they, first of all, this is the, the early church, and Peter and John, who had just been whipped, <laughs> beaten, imprisoned, threatened with their lives over preaching about sharing Jesus, okay? They lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city, there were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you appointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, Look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Wow. Okay. Um, Have you ever set goals for your life? Right, yeah, like, um, I want to lose weight. I want to get in shape. I want to um, learn French. I want to save money so I can go on a trip to China. Um, I want to get a master's degree, and you start setting your, now those are pretty big goals, don't you think? Yeah, now some of the simpler ones are like, I just want to get a job that pays a little better. Maybe a job that I actually like. (laughs) Or I want to pass my classes this semester. Is that a good goal? Yeah, yeah. Now what I've noticed though about most of my goals are about me. Have you ever noticed that? Now you say, well, you can't make goals for anybody else. Well, I could try. Justin, my son, here's your goals, right? That doesn't work. Um, But um, those would be about me too, by the way. (laughs) Things I want him to do, right? So um, yeah, most of my goals are about me, but more than they're about me because I've got to make goals for myself is that they're about me being more, you know? Me having more, me doing more, me experiencing more, more for me. And I have a feeling I really need to have a few more goals that are about less, selfless, a little less of me will go a long way, okay? So even when people start doing spiritual goals, we kind of put spiritual words on them, so often we are trying, if you want to look at it really, we're trying to get God to do what we want. You know how many prayers are really that? God, will you give me, help me? Now, I ask God for a lot of things, but the, and that's not really, um, you know, he's, but it's almost like, God, give me, um, give me a soulmate, you know? God, give me, um, give me, um, bless me, help me, give me, 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 help me, uh, have more money, more stability, more this, more less, less care, comfort me, keep me, all these things are, and when God doesn't do that, right? When God doesn't, somehow it's like, well, you know how people, I tried church, 
Didn't work. You know, I tried, um, I tried praying. I tried reading the Bible. I tried, and it just didn't really go anywhere. It didn't take away my stress. It didn't give me more. It didn't, as if God is here to meet my agenda. Do you realize you were created to reflect God's love and mercy and grace and truth to this world, right? We didn't make God, God made us. That's kind of a basic thing. And so I think we struggle with this and we don't realize what we're actually doing, trying to be more, we actually have less. You know, when Jesus uh, called people to follow him, he didn't make a deal with them. He didn't say, okay, I'm going to bless your little sandals off your feet if you follow me. I'm going to make you rich. I'm going to increase your life and give you all of these things, everything you've ever wanted if you follow me. He didn't make a deal. Do you know what he did? He said, follow me. Boom, that's it. And then later on in like halfway through his public ministry with his disciples, he said this in Luke chapter nine, if anyone would follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So he inverts our conventional wisdom and our thinking there. He says, you want a full life? Don't try to fill yourself up. Don't try to go for it yourself because you're going to lose it all. You want a full life. You want life itself. Well, then lose it. Deny yourself. Give up on yourself. Trust me. Follow me. And then you will gain it all. So maybe you're wondering right now why you might be feeling a bit empty in life why life seems a bit meaningless or purposeless and how you're just kind of going through the motions and even the amusing things you used to do aren't that amusing anymore. There's just not much excitement anymore. And it might be because you're trying to get more and you feel less and less and less. It just never fills. Maybe because I'm too focused on me and getting what I want. And it's time to be selfless. Um, Carl Menninger, I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's a psychiatrist who started the Menninger Clinic in Topeka, Kansas. He's well known. And I think it was way back in the 1950s, kind of even before my time. Okay, yeah, I'm not quite that old. But um, where he was really like, I mean, he's got some really wise things to say. And he was asked in their kind of language of that day, um, what advice would you give to someone who feels a nervous breakdown coming on? I don't think we talk that way anymore, but I think you understand what I'm saying. And his advice back was this, lock your house up, go across the railroad tracks and find someone in need and do something for him. Isn't that fascinating? I think you got it. That's selfless. It'll do you the most good by getting out of yourself and not thinking about yourself and focusing on the needs of others. Haven't you ever noticed that? That's when you feel the most full, when your life is the most exciting, when things just seem to be flowing is when you're not thinking about yourself and focused on yourself and wrapped up in yourself and what am I, you know, and you're actually focused on someone else. It's like now we're finally living. Yeah. So we're going through four, four different messages in this series, selfless. Okay, and I think it's a perfect time to do this. We just started, uh, many churches go through this period called Lent for the lengthening of days. It's the 40 days before um, good, or with Good Friday with the focus of Jesus going to the cross, which was a totally selfless, self-giving time for him and how we're going to now follow in his way and look at this. So the first week today, we're going to look at bold in witness, and that is how sharing Jesus with others is actually a selfless act and how important that is. Then next week, 
We're going to look at faithful in service, how giving of yourself to others makes the difference, and that's the way to live. Third week is generous, extravagant in generosity, and how it's not about my comfort, but it's about the care of others. And finally, the fourth week is grateful in the grind, how just doing the simple things every day and being faithful in those and thankful in those is the best way to live. So those four weeks. In other words, instead of me, me, you know, Lord, can you do what I want? Can you, I need this to fall together and this has to happen and give me and give me and have this work. Instead, it's Lord God, here I am. Here I am, Lord Um, Make me bold in witness, that is, help me to share you and not worry about what other people think at the time, because it's really more about them and not about me, it's about you. That's bold in witness, right? And um, Lord God, um, get me to the point where I use whatever gifts I have for the sake of others and to your glory, that's faithful in service. And Lord God, Help me be so generous that it might even hurt my lifestyle, that I'm out of my comfort zone and do things that go beyond what feels just right for me. And that is being just radical in that kind of generosity, right? Extravagant. And Lord, you know, wake me up in the morning and I see all the mundane things in my life that are just blah, but... Help me be faithful and grateful and thankful in those things because you're right there in the middle of them all. And that's how I can show others you. Grateful in the grind. So, instead of being self-focused, what if we followers of Jesus would strive to live a little more selfless? Starting off by denying ourselves and saying, Jesus, we want you. We want to follow you. Do you realize that's really living? That's really living. That's the abundant life. That's where we find our purpose and significance and meaning and direction in life. That's where you get your joy. So today, it's bold in witness. Now, you might ask right away, wait a minute. What has that to do with selfless? It seems like that's more self-promotion. You're sharing about, you know, your religion with others and nobody wants to hear that anyway. And you're just talking about yourself and what you believe and how is that selfless? And I would argue, first of all, you're not pushing your religion on anyone. If you're doing that, stop. That's not, that's not Christianity. Okay? No. Sharing Jesus, just who he is, is a selfless act. I don't think many people understand this in our society or out in the culture in general, but Christians, when a follower of Jesus shares about Jesus with somebody, he's not saying, she's not saying anything about herself, himself, and how great. We're actually saying we're a mess. We're all, you know, it's not about us. It's really about him. So we aren't more noble. We're not better at anything. We're just sharing Jesus. And yeah, I don't get spiritual brownie points for how many people I've shared Jesus with. I'm already saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. I've got it all given to me already. So, do you understand? So it is really selfless to share Jesus. And I know it's not easy to do. In this day and age, people don't want to talk about these things. But the deal is this. It's good news that we're trying to share. Tell me, you go to a restaurant, you, you have great service, you have a great time. What do you do? Oh, you get up in people's face. Say, oh, you got to try this place. Man, the enchiladas, woo, they're to die for. 
oh my goodness, it was so good. Does anybody go back and say, what, what are you saying? My choice in restaurants aren't any good? <laughs> no, I'm just telling you, this one's fantastic. I'm not saying anything about your choice or, you know, I don't care if you, this is great. That's all we're doing. Do you understand that? It's all we're doing. We're one hungry, satisfied customer, if you want to call it that way, and have gotten filled with a little of Jesus' love and mercy. And it's like, wow, you got to have this. It's so good. Now, you might say, oh, it comes natural to you, John. And I'll tell you, it doesn't. I don't, that's why you're a past. No, you, my Bible is not glowing in the dark, you know, and I open it and automatically it just gives me, whoo, you know, and then I'm just filled. I have nothing. I am no, you know, there was a time in my life I did not want to be a pastor, period. Now, there are more than one, but um, before I became one. And it was precisely because people tend to look at pastor types and say, oh, that's you. Of course, that's what you are like. And it's like, I wanted to be just a high school teacher. Uh, not just, okay, I'm sorry. That, but I wanted to be a high school teacher <laughs> for biology and art. I know, kind of weird. That's what I majored in. Because I wanted to be different and say, no, this is what every Christian is to be like. It's not just about, oh, you're the pastor. You get paid to do that. And it doesn't come naturally. It didn't come naturally to the first disciples. That's what's amazing about this passage in Acts. Because just about a month before this, they are scared to death. Right? This is how it says in John chapter 20. We're going to just look at, the, at this right now. It says this, on the evening of that day, so this was Easter day, so Jesus had resurrected in the morning. They heard about this from the women that morning already. And this is, says, on the evening of that day, so 12 hours later, that evening, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Did you see that? Fear. Fear. That's what came natural to the disciples, the followers of Jesus. They all ran away in fear. They all were scared. They locked the doors. They stayed to themselves. Fear. Fear was natural. The only reason in Acts chapter 4 that their bold in witness is a supernatural act took place. Fear. There are a lot of reasons why people might not be bold in their witness or sharing Jesus with others, but the biggest one I think that's behind almost all of them is, I'm afraid. Now, I might be afraid I don't know anything. I'm afraid they're going to ask a question that I have no idea what the answer is. Well, then Google it. <laughs> we do it for everything. Do you have to know everything? Do you um, we have a few teachers here and others who are thinking about it. And uh, there's a number of college students and others here that are in the classroom. Do you think your teachers know everything? No. Do you think Alex Trebek knows all those answers? <laughs> no, it's not about that. But we're afraid. We're afraid somebody's going to ask a question. We're afraid we're going to get it wrong. We're gonna afraid we're looking silly. We're afraid of... I don't know. I, we're just always afraid. Do you understand? When I am afraid, that is a very self-centered emotion and feeling. I'm concerned about me. I'm concerned about how I look more than your salvation. Yeah, you, Hunter. No. I'm just using you. Get ready. He's coming back, by the way. So... Um, yeah, he's sick of Illinois. I'm sorry if anybody's from Illinois, but what? Be careful about that. Be careful about that. I didn't say anything about Missouri. The Cubs. the Cubs. Well, he's not in that area. He's down by Belleville. Do you know where that is? Yeah, yeah okay. Cardinal country. Not, ne yeah, well, we better stop. <laughs> I'm already dug a hole. Okay, so, um, so we're afraid we're going to, you know, we're afraid we're going to say the wrong thing. We're afraid of what people are going to say. We're afraid we're going to be rejected. 
We're afraid we're going to lose. We're afraid of this and we're afraid of that. And it's really when I look at my fears, my fears are all self-centered survivalist kind of primitive instincts. And to the root of it, fears are selfish. Fear is about me. And like I said, witnessing or sharing Jesus is about others. It's about love. First John 4 puts it this way. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. Whoever fears has not been perfected in love. So looking back now at John chapter 20, 19 through 21, so they're afraid at first, and then Jesus is the one who enters in this locked room, and he says to them, peace be with you, which is just phenomenal. He loves them, absolutely loves them. I'm amazed you didn't come into this room of his disciples and look at them and say, you cowards. You couldn't even stand up to. Do you understand? That's not Jesus at all. But he forgives, he loves, he embraces, he welcomes. He speaks and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. Peace be with you as the Father has sent me, so I send you. And he shows him his hands and sighs. He died for the people who were afraid. Because if he didn't die for people who were afraid, he would have died for no one. Right? And Jesus' presence changed everything. And the gift of the Holy Spirit, which he gives them and promises them, changes everything because it's his presence, his personal presence in the lives of people. And they became bold. So bold. His perfect love cast out their fear. So what do we learn from this? I think this is what we've seen. It's true for everyone. And it's something we have to really understand for these disciples, for us. And that is that we speak boldly about what we believe deeply. Right? We speak boldly about anything that we really believe deeply. I used, you know, wow, I had a great meal. We're even willing... I believe that was a great restaurant. We're willing to talk about that. Hey, if I get these comfortable shoes that feel like I'm walking on air, I am willing to tell you, wow, you got to try these out. You know, I find on Netflix this new series and I tell you, hey, I took three days off of work and I just binged watched the whole thing. You got to try it out. We speak boldly about what we believe deeply that impacts us in a way that says, wow, that matters. What matters? Who matters more than Jesus? Right? Because Peter experienced the resurrection, because he experienced being loved by God, by Jesus Christ himself, personally, completely, When he was the one who denied and walked away and acted as if he never even met him once in his life, that he was personally loved and forgiven and commissioned, it changed him radically and he became bold in his witness. Now I know where we could go with this and you're probably feeling it right now, right? but I'm just going to ask it this way. I'm not going to give you a guilt trip of why we don't. But how can I grow in boldness? That's the question to answer. And I think from this passage, we're going to just talk about two different things, two simple things in this passage that I think are really key to how you and I can actually grow in boldness, be less about ourselves and more about Jesus, less about our fear and much more about his love for this world. And the first is in, uh, to just say this one, spend time, more time with Jesus. Now, you do that by listening to his word, being in fellowship with others, getting into a home huddle and sharing your faith and hearing from others and applying it to your life, reading the scriptures, prayer, etc. This is what's fascinating about the disciples is, um, you know, they were just fish. They had no qualities in themselves that you would 
pick out to be leaders of anything, right? Peter's quality was to put his foot in his mouth. That was his quality and to be impulsive. John and James' quality was to get angry really quick, sons of thunder, and to try to have it their way and be on his right and left. Those were the best qualities we know of these disciples, okay? And in Acts chapter four, before this passage we read, Peter and John are sharing Jesus boldly in Jerusalem just a month after his resurrection, or just a little more, six weeks afterwards. And it says this in Acts chapter four about them. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. And I think Peter, Luke is going, who wrote Acts, going bing, 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 bing. That's the key, be with Jesus. So the, the Greek word behind um, uneducated is this Greek word idiotes, do you know? You know, right? If you've ever felt like an idiot, you're a perfect candidate because God does great stuff with idiots who've been with Jesus. <laughs> you get it? It's not about you. It's about Jesus. It's about what he can do with you. This is, I, I don't know of a person in the Bible where it's like all the quality, God calls and equips people. He does not call those who are already, Moses was a stutter. I mean, David was the ninth in his, uh, of the sons in the family, the run to the litter. Gideon was fearful. I, I don't know of a character in the Bible that it was about them. It was always about God and Jesus and what he, uh, what he could do, what he did, how he did it. So I'm an idiot. Be with Jesus. I love this too. You know, the prayer that they have in this passage, I think sometimes it's, oh, so I really have to be with Jesus. And that means I've got to really pray hard and come up with a, I don't even know what to say. And I feel so stupid. And <clears throat> um, prayer is not about you either. It's not about how you can manufacture the words and come. How did you learn to talk? I don't think you remember when that happened, but your parents and others spoke to you and spoke to you and spoke to you, read stories to you and, and made faces at you and, you know, Google, all that stuff. They went with the simplest words and all of that. And, they, and you, respond, you learned to talk because you were spoken to. So Eugene Peterson says this about prayer. Prayer is not really talking to God. True prayer is answering God. God has spoken. God has spoken through his word. He speaks into your life. He speaks into the disciples, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, so I send you. He spoke to them by sharing his story, his very life with them for three years. He speaks to us through all the stories throughout the scriptures. And when these disciples in Acts 4 get the report from Peter and John and he comes back to them and they come back to the, the, the rest of the followers and they start to pray because they're afraid. They realize now they're facing opposition for the first time. They actually answer God by speaking his word, Psalm chapter two, to God and say, God, sovereign God, you created. And they go through the story of creation. You made everything. And David said, why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? Psalm 2, and they said, this is exactly what happened. And they look then at their life and they basically bring the scriptures in their life together and see how God did it then and spoke then and how God worked and that everything that happened to Jesus was chosen by God to happen. And even the opposition he faced was chosen by God. And so they heal their own hearts through their prayer because they're answering God with his word and promises. That's prayer. My prayers suck. They're not good. But answering God with his scriptures, that's the only time they're any good and they're great. That makes the difference. 
strategically they took his word, they lived by it, and they became bold. They overcame those fears. They, not by themselves, and God gave them boldness. They talked with Jesus. It was a God-centered prayer, not the type that I do. It's like, help me, make me, give me, do 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 prayers, but a God-centered prayer based on what God is doing and has been doing in the world. If you want to grow in boldness, be with Jesus. Secondly, you want to be bold? Ask God to make you bold. I don't know if you've ever done that. Do we pray to be? You know, my prayers tend to be, if I was in that situation, my prayer, unlike theirs, would have been, God, get rid of this opposition. God, protect us. God, help us. God, make it easy. You know, they don't pray for that. They pray for boldness. They pray for boldness. They pray and ask him for boldness to be more selfless, to be more focused on his kingdom, and they receive that. I, don't you want to live that way? Don't you want to live a little less about you and a lot more about God and his kingdom and others? Don't you want to be free from worrying about yourself all the time and focused on yourself and what you need? Don't you really want to be more selfless than selfish? I think you really do. I think we all do. The truth is we speak boldly about what we believe deeply. And God's perfect love in Jesus Christ will cast out your fear. Believe that deeply, absolutely to the core of your being, that God has a perfect love for you in Jesus Christ, that he loved the world so much that he gave his only son, and through him gave you everything, and through his death and resurrection, you've got it all, already given to you, absolute. About, um, whew, I guess 20 years ago, I had a privilege. I was a pastor in California at the time, and I had the privilege of um, meeting with an older gentleman named Bud Hedinger. He was, I think, 89 years old. Never had been a Christian, never was baptized. And um, he felt really guilty about it all because, um, well, the reason he decided he was shaken to his core because he had been diagnosed with cancer and it was terminal and he knew he had about a year to live and finally he realized it's time. <laughs> and so I came and talked to him and Irma, his wife, and um, he's the oldest person I've ever baptized. Um, and I was able to share with him um, that he had no reason to be afraid and no reason to be ashamed and no guilt over it. It wasn't about his 89 years before this, it's all now about your future. It's all about your future. It's all about what God is doing. It's never about your past. With Jesus, it's always about your future in that way. He forgives, he renews, he restores, he moves you. And uh, he was baptized and about six months later, I got a call, I think it was about three in the morning that he, had he was dying. And I ran over to the house, I got there just a little late he had just passed away, and I, Irma, his wife, was just weeping. His son, uh, Mark, um, who was a member at uh, that church out there, and Janet, his wife, were there, and we prayed. And I was able to share with Irma and the rest, he's with the Lord now. There's no question about this. This isn't about Bud and what he's done or not done in life. This is not about how good or noble or how right or smart or any of those things. It wasn't about him. It was always about Jesus. And at that funeral, just a couple days after, able to share with everyone there, not about how great Bud was, though he had quality, but about Jesus. You know, the one thing I don't want to ever have happen, and it probably has, I'm sorry to say, 
is to have anybody ever come to me and say, hey, yeah, I've known you for a long time. And uh, we've talked about the weather <laughs> and sports and our neighborhood and our family. And we've talked about all these things. And even politics and culture and history and travel. But I never heard from you about Jesus. Do you understand that? I mean, that would just be tragic. Because I, I don't have, who cares about my opinions about all those other things or what I've, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. So um, I don't know where you're at. And it's not just about church and about Sunday. You know, the last thing I need you to talk to you about is church. I need to talk to you about Jesus. Um, but like Bud, whatever age you are, if before this point in time you're going, oh, yeah, but I didn't, yeah, yeah, it's about Jesus right now and you. And his perfect love is here for you to cast out any of your fears, to give you confidence that you're his, you're loved, you're absolutely his no matter what, and nothing can change that. And so I want to pray for us right now, and especially for anyone who's never quite welcomed him in, if you want to put it that way. So let's do that, shall we? Lord God, Father, we haven't been bold we seem to believe so many things deeply, but somehow you, I don't know why, Lord, I guess we think it's about us and it's really always been about you. It's not about how much we know or how much we can do. Lord, help us to be idiots who've been with you <laughs> so that it's really about just you and not us. Make us selfless, deepen our faith, deepen our understanding or our comprehension or our reception of your love, that it goes to the depth of our being so that it just casts out any of the fears that we have about what other people might think or how silly we might look and make us selfless so that we are willing to take the chance and risk anything for you and give others the opportunity to hear about you through us. May your perfect love cast out that fear and for some of us today, it might be this is the time to welcome you in for the first time. We've stayed at a distance, and so I want to pray with them right now and just say, Father, forgive. Love me. Come near. Have me. all of me for all of you because you gave all of you, Lord Jesus, for me. And may, may you make me joyfully bold by your perfect love. Amen.